All right. So I am presenting today on debugging. Um, yeah. So preface. Um, everything I learned about debugging is from Jenny Bryan. Um, and a lot of this will come. A lot of these. Um, a lot of this content comes from either um, what they forgot to teach about R in chapter eleven um, from her talk at our studio conf this year. And also um, Hadley's video on minimal reprex for Shiny App. That's actually really useful in, in how I like changed. I changed the entire way I debug Shiny Apps after watching this uh, video. So I think it's useful for you guys to check that out later. Um, if you're looking for more of a talk or a text or some other like not just tan like stumbling through debugging, um, highly recommend. So today's plan, um, we all read the chapter, so I'm going to take the liberty to live code some debug debugging. On the way, we'll, get, we'll try to hit um, traceback, print debugging, browser, debug, debug once, and undebug. That's the one where you actually debug other fu other functions from other packages. So you're not just debugging your own fun function, but you're debugging another function. So I'll show you browser first, and then I'll show you debug. Um, and then options, error equals recover, kind of shows you the same thing. Um, so we'll start with, you know, some examples, a few contrived, a few less contrived, and lastly, possibly, if you guys are interested, a Shiny app. Um, I'll, I don't have a bugged Shiny app just yet, but I can show you how I would interact with it in terms of browser. Um, so that's the plan. Questions so far? All good? Woohoo! Yay. All right. So examples, easy mode. Uh, we'll use one of the canned examples from our stats. Um, W2F, that's the website the book is on. Um, and I have uh, copied and pasted this and it does like a cloning thing. So I've already got it down for you guys. So this is the, um, this is the, this is what the first example set would be. Um, so there is a bug when you run get climates, that this function here. Um, use traceback to figure out where it occurs and browser calls and inputs. So in order to run it, we are going to use all of these things. So I'm just sourcing the entire file just for now. And nothing broke. I don't think anything broke. Oh wait, it did break. It, did, it didn't run the function. Okay. It didn't run the function like it told us to do. And it says it can't open the connection. Um, it can't open the file because there is no such file. Um, so where, so I guess the first thing to look at would be traceback. Um, so you can see that it's called from the read CSV file, um, which calls read table and then calls it on this file argument. So we can look in this read CSV argument and there is no file. I thought this was a file. This isn't a file. Uh, okay, so if we're debugging it like this, the WTF debugging master, this should point at, there is no activities folder, is there? So I guess it should just point at planets.csv. I think that makes sense. So we're going to try it again. So we're going to source this function and then run get climates. And now we have a different error. Um, string split vector comma non-character argument. So again, run traceback. Um, you can see it's in uniqueify, which is an interesting name. Um, clean vector at debugging Spartan number 17 and then debugging Spartan number nine. So the vector should have a comma. What? Okay, so we want to know what's in this particular vector. Um, so what's like, you know, we I don't know what this exact problem is. So it'd be a really good idea for us to like be able to examine the vector that's passed into here. Um, so what we can do is use uh, browser, throw it in here, um, and then what this will do is open a debugging window 
uh, an open debugging window, and that basically just gives you control of the console inside this environment. Not this environment or this environment, but this one. Um, so I'm going to run this clean function. Tan, here. did you put the browser function there because the trace back, the first thing that it spits back is that string split. So that's where you know where to put your browser function? Yeah. 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 So I, I don't know what, I don't know anything that's going on, but I want to look at this um, string split function. So I am putting it right here. Um, you know, you could look at it like earlier, like what's passed into clean, um, in which case you could pack put browser here. And actually, I should have just done this because that's way funny. Uh, okay, so we're going to rerun this again. And now we are, we have a browser window um, open inside clean. Um, so we have an unevaluated promise. Oh, that's yeah, because I haven't looked at that. Okay, so what- Tan, I'm interrupting you again. John asked, why aren't you getting that like interactive GUI traceback option in the console when your code errors? Like, you know how, I, I don't know, I get it in my R studio that like- Yeah, sometimes not others. That, Oh, yeah. Uh, debug on error. Yeah, it depends uh, on your message only. Settings. And I think uh, you can change this. Whoa. Which did the same thing because I called browse, but yes. Um, okay. So from inside of here, we can examine what VEC is by typing VEC. And we can see that it is a factor with five levels, um, frozen, murky, blah, blah, blah. And we get this unhelpful number back. That's useless. OK. Uh, string split vec on comma. Maybe you have to like convert it to a character first. That could be it, yeah. Uh, so it wants to string split on vec. There's so this second entry is has a space and a comma in it. Yeah, so it'll split that. Uh, it's split if it's a character. character. Yeah. Okay. So we can do. Um, that is as character that. Uh, oops, I pressed escape. I wasn't supposed to do that, I guess, but we can rerun it. Um, and I think that did the trick. Yeah, it did the trick. So we've gotten the unique climates from the um, values. Does that make sense? Can we review what just happened? So you use oh. browser, and that magically gave you back vec because that's the first. Why why was that with browser returned at step one? Like my mental model was that browser will just return string split vec or whatever, however you would pronounce that. The browser just opens a window inside of this function environment. Is that clear? Oh, so okay. it, yeah. It so, opens the environment in interactive mode. So like opens our studio with everything that is inside the environment that is visible from here. So I'll run that again. Uh, oh, and now he got the little I, the thing we were talking back. about. Yeah, this thing. So I can show trace back. Yeah. Um, but I turn it off because I find it annoying. <laughs> that, I didn't even know you could do that. So that's awesome. Yeah. Um, and then I'm OK, really so ahead. when you run browser, we are now in cl the clean function environment, not global anymore. Correct. We are in the clean oh. function. You can recognize it by we are in clean and not in global. Oh, hey. Check that out. So VEC is a promise, as you can see here. 
And so because it ha hasn't been evaluated yet, it gets evaluated when you call it. Um, you can run print VEC instead of browser, and what it would do is it would spit out VEC by evaluating. Um, I don't know why it evaluates in mid our studio session like that, but that seems kind of weird, uh, but you know, whatever. Um, but when you, it, essentially when you run browser, you can print that into your console and do that. You can also actually, you can actually, if this was a data frame, for example, you can click inside of here and open it as if you were like viewing a data frame in normal R studio. Ah, auto okay, cool. So you're, you're, I'm just trying to like fully solidify this before we move on. Sorry, everyone. Like your thought process was VEC is available in this environment. Let's go look at it. That's how you knew to look at VEC before. And then that's how that led the train of thought to change it to a character. So what I noticed here was that this, the string split function is broken. So you start evaluating the arguments of string split. And by doing that, I want to be in the environment where string split is being called. And that's why I put browser here. Um, and then looked at it, looked at this VEC item that's going to be passed into string split. Okay. And then remember when you did VEC and you set that to as character VEC, can yes. you can you mess with the clean environment while you're in browser still? Or do you have to leave, go into real life global and then reopen the browser? Uh, you can execute the function and then continue the rest of the function like this. And it should spit out the rest of the stuff. Cool. You, you can make edits, but you can't like, you can't change the lines of code that are going to be run. Right? Uh, you can yeah. run new lines of code to modify what your data looks like currently. No, I think you can. Um, do that again. Like you can't, Tyler, are you saying like we can't change str string split to like some other fun function? You, like change it instead of comma, do a comma space. Right. You, you, you can't well, I'm pretty sure you can't do that because like it's if the function's already been evaluated it's not modifying it'll work that once but it won't work the next time like yeah I mean you you could you can run that but when you hit next it'll uh, it'll still you run just the finish the rest of this function by just pressing this button here yeah I see what you're you saying Tyler I'm, I'm just trying to think of your like um, the workflow of debugging so you have to constantly be going back and forth, back and forth. Like if I wanted to change this to comma space, I'd have to get out of the browser, do that, then rerun browser. Yeah. But Tan is shaking his head in disagreement. I think so. I mean, We're you could do it once. Like if you wanted to just try it on that one, whatever you passed in that one time. But yeah, the next time you run it, you have to go back out and then like resource the function. For, for okay, yeah, that's what I was asking you. With, like, can you function. can you tinker with it and be like, oh shit, that didn't work. Let me do this. Let me do that, and then you find something that works, and then you apply the one that works in real life. So yeah. what you're saying is, I wouldn't be able to edit this function. Yes, you cannot edit it once you're inside the function. Sure. I mean, you can edit it, but like if you say, then continue to run it it's still going to be there. It's still part of the function that you're running. Oh, you're saying this one. This is a read only. I wonder what, how that was different. Because I was just able to finish off the rest of that call just now. It's like it's because it's because you converted it the error was that the vector was a factor, not a character. And so you converted the vector to a character and that made it work. It's not because you put the extra code there to do it, but you actually ran that code yourself. If you had, you know, uh, if you hadn't run as that character vec, then it still would have caused the error.
Okay. Um, so the next set of functions is debug. So I'm just going to try it. I'm going to try it in the next thing here. Um, I'm going to debug the clean function. What so I, I have a question also. Yeah. You can force an eval here, can't you, by actually doing it sooner than, like, in, in the promise, you can actually force it to be evaluated sooner than it, it would, right? So would that change the course of the flow of the function during the process of debugging? Or, like, uh, I mean, could it kind of change the way it behaves in real life? I don't think I understood that. Yeah, like, I think it can, there can be a discrepancy there. It's like, if you needed to use like force at some point, like later in the function, but then you actually, uh, but like, yeah, it can make a difference, but like it will almost never make a difference. Um, yeah, it, I think my I had asked a similar question a few weeks ago, I think, and we came up with an example where like early evaluation of the promise can cause different output to happen. Mm. If it was like Arlang kind of thing? Yeah. You know, in most cases, mm -hmm. no, it shouldn't matter, but it could. Yeah. Yeah, I think I actually have that as one of the examples here. Uh, cool. Thanks. But yes. Yeah. Early evaluation of a promise in the browser window could lead to unexpected effects. It's true. Good, 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 good. Okay, um, so I guess the, what did we do with all of that? So we did trace, the, trace back, I'll show you that, um, print debugging, um, print would be the same as browser, except you just print the one thing and, and it continues with the rest of the function. Um, browser is what we did. Um, debug kind of shows you, it's the same thing as browser, um, except you call it on the function. So it like, it's like a function um, operator is that right? Function operator. Um, instead of in interactive, like you don't just change the source code, you just ins like you're you're uh, manually inserting debug, like a browser call into your um, whichever function you call it on. Um, so if we want to look at what what this clean function is, um, I think if I run debug clean, it automatically will anytime this clean function is now called, it will like um, debug that function. So it will open a browser window at the top level of that function, which is what happens here. And then it's putting you back into this vector, like into this browse, into this clean function and looking at, you know, this unevaluated promise effect and anything else that's in here. Why would you use this as opposed to browser? Like what are, this is um, what I feel need. overwhelmed with all these different tools. So yeah, I'm just so stick with printing. Browser <laughs> is if you own the code. Debug is what you're supposed to use when you don't own the code. So like you can debug. Um, one second. You can debug uh, string split. So what would happen here is you would rerun your function again, and it would try to put you in to, into, the, into the string split, but it's internal, so it did this, <laughs> which is kind of useless. But do it for a string trim. Sure, we can do string trim instead. Uh, quit. No. Escape, 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 escape. Stop. Oh. There we go. This Whatever. is also why I hate the browser. <laughs> I'm like, WQ, you know. get me out of here. <laughs> this is like exiting Ben. Yeah. <laughs> you can <laughs> never <WQ>. leave. <laughs> have, have you seen that, that meme where like you put an infinite number of monkeys in a room and they'll still never be able to get out of Ben? <laughs> I think I'm stuck. I've not so, seen that one. You didn't see this comic? No, I haven't seen that meme he's talking about. If I'm still in this after restarting R, I'm going to laugh. <laughs> I'm still in R. Okay, good. All right. Uh, 
Did you say string string trim? Yeah. So we'll clean, uh, we'll do debug once string trim. Run the tidy burst first. Does that include string r? It does include string r. Okay. And then we'll debug string trim, and then run this entire function, and that puts us debugging somebody else's function, which is I think is one of the questions that came up earlier. Um, so you can see what's happening and the string that's being passed in. Um, so flat values is being passed in, which is this one. Um, and we can inspect flat values, um, which is now a string, I think. It's this string here. So string. There. So that's flat value. So we're debugging string trim in this case. Um, so check which side, which is the side argument here. Um, in this case, uh, we didn't pass a thing in, so it's going to look at both. And then if this, then do string trim left. If not, do string trim right. And otherwise, do both. Um, so it's going to run um, this one. So it's you know evaluating. So side is both, and then switch. Now it's going to run one of these switch cases, which is string trim both, I think, and then continued on with the rest of the function. <laughs> okay. Um, any questions on that? I think that was. I think so that. We did most of the things I wanted to do there. Did you explain undebug? Undebug reverses your function operator that changed clean or a string trim. So you need to undebug string trim and it will remove the debugger from it. Um, in this case, so if you're going to only look at it once, you can use the argument, the function called debug once, and it will only run once and then remove the um, browser function or the debug function from that function. And yes, your source may look different. Um, I don't remember when I updated this thing. Apologies. <laughs> Maybe it's string split without the underscore. Oh yeah, that. You're looking at the string R split. Okay, yeah, I see. Okay, not bad. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so that was the first example. Um, so hard mode, I, I stumbled on a Maya, how do I debug this question a little while back? So surprise, metaprogramming review um, in this, this, this question. So does anybody remember what this problem was about? Because I don't really remember. So I'm going to copy and paste this back in. But basically, this set of function, um, I was like, I should be able to use browser or something to look at what's going on here. Um, so we can do that. But it may help us to get the context later, if that helps. Does anyone actually remember, like offhand? That was Darren's. Darren, are you still here? Um, Darren is still here. Darren does not remember. He doesn't remember. <laughs> so we'll just debug it anyway. Um, completely blind because, you know, what the hell. Um, is there anything in here that, so will this run? Okay, so I'm going to restart the session and clean the console. And it's a little, okay. So we're going to put these functions into our environment. Add a frame into our environment, and then subsample df x equals 1. Um, object x is not found. Great success. Um, it's in the eval tidy of subset 2. Where does eval tidy happen? So here-ish. Um, so when does subset two get this thing? Okay, so we call subset two here. 
and then it goes into here somewhere. So let's start with putting a browser into uh, here. I'm just guessing. This is kind of how I debug things anyway. So you are following along in the madness behind the method. Okay, so cond is um, a, what do you call this? Tilde? Lambda? Lambda cond, which doesn't look right. So I think if I remember, I'm, I'm gradually remembering here, um, but this cond argument probably won't work. Um, so we're binding a value to our caller environment. The val is equal to three. And then rows val is going to use rows and data. Um, and I think this is because rows is not x equals equals one, um, which I think it's meant to be, right? So that's where we get the problem. Um, it's because rows is an expression cond and not the expression x equals equals one. Um, and I think it actually might need to be an enclosure as well. So if we, I'm going to go back to this subset. I think what we need is, is it the curly curly here? Oh no, so we need an uh, cond and flow our lane and flow cond and then bang bang there. Again, we're kind of going back to our standard like just put it through our lane and hope it works. Um, but we are gonna try it now. So we run that. So now we can see that this has changed to x equals equals one. Um, and so when we evaluate this, it should do as expected and return a vector of true, 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 false, false, um, which we'll then use to subset data. And continue. So we got the result we were expecting, which was a subsample of df where x equals equals one. Um, and that's this table right here, I think. Everyone follow that? So cond was an enquo and it wasn't supposed to be, something needed to be evaluated. Like wh how would you summarize what we just did here? Yeah, so um, previously cond was being evaluated, wasn't being converted from this symbol to what it actually represented. So the way okay. is works is you take df, which is the data frame, and I think I'm, am I stuck in this thing again? Oh, no. Okay, good. Um, so you take, take a subsample of this data frame where x equals equals one. Okay, so you need to pass this x equals equals one thing into your uh, sub functions, which are um, subset two and resample. Um, resample, I think, is okay because we're just we we use subset two. What am I doing here? Uh, it wasn't even being used. Okay. No. Yeah, it is. Okay, so it's being used here. Um, but the problem was in here where we weren't passing cond into this function properly. And so this function expected the x equals equals one, but because we weren't evaluating it with quasi quotation, that's what the bang bang does, is it converts the, um, is it quasi quotation here? It's quotations, I think, because we're passing along the environment that this is being evaluated in remember correctly? I'm not sure. Somebody help me. <laughs> You're saying a lot of words and they're making sense, but you know, if you wrote it down, I don't know if it makes sense. Okay. So 
I will try writing it down and you guys can look at the screen and I will try to talk slower. Um, let's have a look at that. So cond is x equals equals one. Yeah. But inside subset two, cond is not being evaluated as x equals equals one. Um, it's being enclosured here. Yeah. And that's not being captured properly. So we need to evaluate it. Like we need to pass this exact thing into subset two. Okay. So by using browser, we saw the little tilde cond. And that's how we were able to say, aha, I want that to be x equals equals one, not cond. Right. Cool. So and then the, also the, side the, question, is that tilde a is that denoting that it's a formal? It's a language object, I think. Like, uh, that's what I meant, yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a closure. It's a subclass of language, right? Yeah. Like in LM or whatever. Closure is yeah, always put the tilde on them. But the closure is subclass of formula. It's cold because you unquote the line before. Got it. And yes, I wish I could make all my Arlang problems look this easy. Um, we this is a really cooked example, and um, yeah. Um, I don't think this is easy. <laughs> the, the the thing with subset, like it, you can't like nest it like two functions deep because it only ever knows to look in the caller environment. Is that right? I mean, yeah. I know this is like a custom subset, but I think it still suffers from that same problem. Yeah, I think that makes sense. What if you use browser on a function that has a function inside of it? Do you go into that function's functions environment? Or do you stay in the parent functions environment? you are put into whichever function that you've called browser in. So you can go into okay. those functions if you want to. Wait. Can you? My, my last question is if the, if the function is defined inside of the calling function? Mm -hmm. hmm. I'm confused at the question. Uh, can you say that again? Big, Possibly in different ways? Yeah. <laughs> Darren, you want to try? Uh, <laughs> Words are hard. Uh, like, I think we actually have to write a code, like, and see. Yeah, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, okay. Um, like a, like code, that, like a, just an arbitrary function inside this, subset two function that just like adds a column or something. Um, how would you debug that random function inside subset two? Sorry, I got distracted with this, these function, these things trying to try to see if that helped the question. And I don't think I heard that. Right. Uh, oh yeah, I think Darren was asking like, so what if you have like a function defined in another function? Um, you know, that's another, like, a way to do internal functions. Um, I, like, I guess you could do, I think you would just treat, like, you know, use the same tools like browser, uh, would still work the same, I think. Um, I don't know, you'd have to, I, I don't think I've ever tried that before, though. Yeah, what Tyler said. Yeah, the thing in the chat. Yeah, that's, that's okay. Make that work. Tan. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, oh, People, stop moving the chat thing. <laughs> God damn it. Can I not copy this? This, this example will illustrate and it's something I think is annoying with browser. Yeah. So 
this will be evaluated, if I understand this correctly, you call outer, it defines this function inner and then calls it, but the function inner has browser in it, so then it puts you back inside inner. Yeah. Uh, I thought, See? I thought my next question was if the browser was in outer, would you go into inner? Well, now uh, I kind of want to know both. <laughs> well, you put a browser outside of the inner too. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so like put, put browser like, online too. Yeah. Online that's, too. That's what I put there. Right? Yeah. yeah. Take it online, fine. Now, now uh, call debug on outer <laughs> and then run outer. <laughs> Well, you don't need to call debug because it will just hit the browser. Yeah, no, I just want to add some extra confusion. Being a troll. But like, I think you have to take it out of line five to be sure if the one on line two is causing it to go into inner, it would just step through inner. So you can figure out which one you're in by looking at this chunk right here. We'll tell you which environment you're in. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. When you get Run to the second browser, it will actually start a new browser. Yeah, so yeah, it should run it. Like if you run from in here, it will put you in another layer of browser. Okay, so called from outer, you are here. Now run next. So it's going to run this function um, when I press this. So now you know you have a function called inner. Then you call inner. You are now another layer in the rabbit hole. Um, you can see you're in the inner, not in the outer, or you're in the inner, which is inside the outer, which is inside the global. Thanks for making me say words. <laughs> um, okay, so you're gonna run, you, you've run browser. So the next thing you're gonna run is message inner. So it messaged inner and kicked you back out because that was the end of the function. And now you message outer. Which, did I put outer inside out? No, okay, so the, the final result of this function is outer because I put message outer here and then it kicked me out of that whole function. I, I, I think I would want to specify that like when you went, when you ran the inner function, you did that by pressing in. Right, but if you, if you, if you didn't have that browser on line five, running in to do next wouldn't take you inside of the inner function. Ah. Okay. So you want to what? Run this? Do it again. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sort of... Okay. So it's going to run this. It's going to create this function called inner, yep. which messages the word inner. Okay. And then, so you now have a function and you're about to run the inner function. When you run the inner function, it says inner. And then you message your, your final line of this messages outer, and then you're done. Right. So we never get to go in the inner environment. Not by pressing in. Not by pressing, wait, by, by pressing next, not by pressing in. What yeah. do you mean by pressing in? The letter N. Oh, I didn't. N is the. You, you have to step, you have to step into the inner function using S. Right. So I can step into this function with, there's, you can manipulate this with the keyboard, right? I told you. So right. the second type line. This yeah, one. Yeah, or just type S. But. Yeah, I don't think I can, I don't think, I think that will break my brain, Tyler. Thanks though. Um, and so yeah, you, so yeah, so you, you, you're now inside the inner function. Same idea. In the inner function, even though you- But you can't, that. you can't just N and N your way there. Right. No, okay. one of them has to be S. So S is like browser that function. But honestly, I, I don't expect, I expect exactly what we're seeing. Like that's, isn't that the whole reason why they've designed or stepped into and next, like those are supposed to have different behaviors for this kind of situation. So now we're in message and um, we could continue down message if we wanted to but I am just going to execute the rest of that. 
and we're out. I think. That makes sense. By the way, you're also using printing here, so you're using another form of debugging. I am debugging while I am debugging. Yeah. So I'll say the one annoying thing was with with browser like this. Like, let's say you put the get rid of the browser on line two, put the browser back in line five. Yeah. Then when you run outer, you'll end up in inner, and there's no way for you to get to get back out of that inner function. So if you run outer now. Oh. You just go Man. inner to global. Wait, no, There's click no... on the tree spec on the on the right hand side. Can you can you do it there or no? You can. T it'll take you to where the line was, but there's no way for you to like continue. Oh yeah, yeah. From yeah, outside you know. of this. Yeah, not even like step out of which is yeah, like. There's, the no, there's no step out in R. Right. I I don't know why that is. Interesting. Yeah. I think it's because you're modifying the inner function, not the outer function. So it's like because it's functional. It's like it's almost like a wrapper or it's not a wrapper, like a operator or whatever. You're changing the inner function to have an interactive mode, not the outer function. So you can only look at the source ref, but you don't. You can't actually like go up. Yeah, it just seems it, it, it seems like something like you should be able to to continue. You know, basically, like continue execution, like just keep browsing doing whatever this right. is why um at least that this is why recover exists is because when you do a thing i'm gonna change this to a stop so it'll be so you can track it back with trace back again so one of the things you can do is use um Recover. So error equals recovery. And error and recover is a lot like browser, except it lets you, so it it's really only useful in this like error recovery thing. It's used like that. Okay. So this is a function called recover. Um, and when there is an error, you run the recover function. Um, and what that will do is give you a cho choice of frames to run. So you can run outer now. And it will let you choose whether to be inside outer or inner. God, why did we name it like this? Okay, they're so they're we well-named functions. <laughs> so we can be in, we can choose to go into outer or into in. Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> So we can go into the inner function, um, continue, and then go back into the outer function and continue on with ourselves, blah, blah, blah. And that's what the yeah. recover function does. It, it's meant to do browser, but you choose which frame of the trace back you want to go into. So wait, you can go from inner to outer using this or no? No, but you can choose which layer of the onion you want to be in. Okay. Whether that's the outer layer or the inner layer. <laughs> like each, yeah, each time you're calling a function, right, you gotta imagine like it's creating this new execution environment and then you step into that frame and you do something. Mm -hmm. and, and the recover allows you to say, all right, I'm, I, I know I, 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 in actuality, I'm at this error that occurred on line five but I can jump back to say, how did I get here? Show me all the different environments that I, all the different functions I was running that led to this call. You can't continue past that error. Like you, there's, there's no way to fix the error. That makes sense. Once, you, once you're there. Um, but you can see what did, what did each of the different function environments look like that got you to that point. Do you have another example for options error equals recover? I want to see it again. Sure. So let's use it back here. Um, not there. I don't want to do it there. I want to do it here. Okay. 
Yay, zero to X, it works. Congratulations. All right. Um, so I did set the option just now. So it should still work um, to run this function called get climates. But instead of just spitting out an error, it will bring us into that recover. Okay, so we are now in the recovery mode of um, get climates, and we can choose which frame number to get into. So we can go into um, the into this one by going to number six, which is the read CSV environment. And inside this, we can see that the file in question is trying to call. God, there's so many folders. I'm going to blame John for that one. Um, this file path, which is, has activities in it, but that file path doesn't exist. So we know that we need to change this. We run the function in. And now we have a different error, um, the string split error. So we can choose which frame to go into of these ones, um, whether it's the string split one or the clean one or the uni uniqify one. Um, and I think we identified previously that it's not the string split. Well, we can look inside the string split one, but we want to be, we, we need to change something in clean. So we can look inside clean, like my first, like I did initially, and that will put you in here um, to look at VEC, which is a factor. You can't string split a factor. So what's the difference between a frame and an environment? They're the same thing. Context. The source. We use parent frame in base in base R. Um, Frames is S terminology according to the if you do like a question mark parent dot frame. It just says frame is the S terminology for environment. Yeah. But I think it amounts to something similar. I can't remember exactly. Uh, on the previous example, you had frames that allowed you to drill into the inner and the outer functions and all. But I mean, here there are functions within string split all the way down to like base R functions and formals and things like that. Does it not give you the option to do to keep drilling down into like the guts of string split? So the error happens on at string split. So you can go into eight. But you can't go deeper than that this way, in this way. If it's in the C code, no. What I want to do, uh, oh, I want to do N. Um, so you can go into eight, and then from here, go down deeper into whichever one you want by using the step in function. But those aren't frame but, options from your. But they're not choice of frame because it stops, it, it goes through your traceback, and your error happens here. So then, like this, the error reporter is in string split. So you can't. You, you, it just puts you here, but because from here you can use browser to go deeper wherever you want, you right. can use it to do what you've wanted to do, essentially. Right. So what you're saying is like, can you go deeper frames like into each one of these functions? You can, you would just do it from. Um, right, it, but it's not giving you those frames as options here in this list of one to eight. Correct, it, it, from one to eight, kind of where the error happens is where it calls the uh, where your options are to go in. So like from where you called it to where the function actually happened, where the error actually happened, are the frames that you get to choose. And then from the browser window that you are in the lowest level frame, you can keep going down until right. you get the internal. Right. Thanks. No problem. That sounded good, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's about, that's about it. Okay, um, 
any other things that people wanted to cover? It's 8.50. Um, I can answer more questions. Um, I can open a Shiny app and show you how I use browser in it. Um, but it's very similar to what you guys would be seeing here. So it's up to you guys. Do you ever use breakpoints? Rarely. I find them annoying. Like I do too. Why? Hadley, Hadley promotes them, but I think they're a pain <laughs> about to use. I mean, if I'm going to, so he thinks you can just use, so in, so breakpoints, I didn't go over breakpoints at all, did I? Uh, well. <laughs> when in doubt. I hope that fixed it. Um, Air equals null. Oh, that's cool. Thank you. Um, you can use breakpoints by clicking this sidebar here. And what this will do is actually put a breakpoint into, like, open a browser window right here. So it's the equivalent of writing browser right there. But you just click breakpoint instead. Like just click beside this line 10 and it will put a browser window before line 10. That's how you're supposed to read breakpoints. Why do you think it's annoying? It's when it does the did, same thing as what, before. Do you, do you see how it's an open circle right now and it's not a closed circle and there was a little warning that popped up on the top? Yeah, you have to like source it. You have to, the, to, in order to get this to work, like you have to be constantly saving. It, it needs to be in a file that gets saved. Oh. Yeah, so it, and, like, it runs a source. It, so you can see the command always requires a source. Um, and it reuses debug source instead of the normal source function um, in order to bring this browser window up, which means you're functionally saving the error over and over and over and over, and over again, which is kind of annoying. Not like get committing the error or anything, but you're like saving. You're saving the file with the error in it. And, and so for me, like I, I, I tend to write a lot like a, and just, you know, just open up a new script. It's not a file. It doesn't have a name, nothing in it. You can't use breakpoints in that. You can use browser. You can use browser, but you can't put a breakpoint in there because it, it has to be a save file. Right. That's a actually helpful distinction. Mm. Yeah. yeah, Tyler wants to get to his untitled 23. Uh, he needs to, yeah. doesn't, doesn't want to save the files. Wait, I need to clutter up my workspace. <laughs> uh, Tyler, what else do you hate about this chapter? That was one major thing. It, it, it was just, it felt it was too brief. Like right? there, there needed to be and it's hard to do in a book, but I mean, kind of like what Tan's doing now is like you need to be able to go in there and see how these things actually work. Yeah, I actually don't recommend the advanced art debugging at all. I found it less helpful mm -hmm. than um, the RStats WTF book that I was working through here. Um, this has more stuff, and it also gives you like examples on it and um, like actual code to debug. So like, there's like this use this course, RStudio WTF, which basically like clones this file. So this repository here gets cloned to your computer and then you can debug any of these files with the, um, to like follow along with the book. That's cool. So I think it's, I think this is just a better resource altogether. Um, Trace is like, hey. yeah. Hey Tom, um, sorry to uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I actually missed that part because I was talking to my kid. What, which book is this? The one that you just have displayed up there? So I'm, I mentally call it RStats WTF. Um, it's what they forgot to teach you about R and it came out <gasps> this year. Gotcha. Okay, Throw it in the Slack later, please. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Ten, you um, what is up with... Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, go sorry. ahead. Uh, <laughs> Dan, you mentioned something from Hadley at the very beginning as well, another resource. What was that? So yeah, so this is a, so Hadley likes to use um, browser when debugging Shiny. 
um, because it will put him inside the function environment of um, thing. I'll, I'll, I mean, this will go on to the repo. This will go into the repo. Um, mm -hmm. You guys can come back to this. Um, but essentially, there is this video called minimum a minimal reprex. Um, a minimal reprex for stuff, and in this 22 minute video, he'll like debug some random shiny app um, and like use browser to get into it. I had never once seen debugging shiny other than print this thing, super sign this data frame out of the app into your global, and then deal with the data frame and then like bring it back. So, like, I was doing it kind of not the right way. So, having browser was super helpful. Mm. It, and it's great because you can, I mean, you can access all the reactives from the browser environment too. Yeah. So what happens is actually you, you, you're you accessing it as if it was an app. Let me see if I have a good app to look at. Uh, success okay so you can see that like I've got this app it loads similarity scores um, blah 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 but one of the things like what happens like how do you like look at some of the code that runs this you yes. can insert a browser so that you can look at any one of these things and then you can access it you can access the data frame that so like um, you can access the data frames and any of these things when you're inside the browser window by just calling the function user bracket and it will show you what is being accessed by this calculate player sims function, for example. So I'll throw a browser in here. If I think this is the problem, I'll throw a browser in there and then run this thing. Um, and it'll stop at browser and will let will show me, um, will let me like call user with this function. And it'll tell me that there isn't a user yet, which I guess it's okay. So continue. Uh, did I call an app from inside the browser window? That's great. <laughs> okay, so don't do that. Um, so you'll notice I was still in the string split debug right. and called, a, called an app in it. And um, that was weird. So don't do that. Let's try that again. That's one thing to be be aware of when you do make changes to your function while you're browsing. I find I commonly will like re-execute the definition, but I did that in the browser, not in the global, let's say, and like it didn't change anything. So you fix it, but you didn't fix. So yeah, so this so this app like calls all these functions, right? So you can see in the global environment of this app, before anything happens, you've got all these functions together. Um, I had to press C because it's a reactive, so it checks all the reactives before you even get to use it as a user. Um, and then you press this load similarity scores, and it's brought me back into SimScores Player, um, from which I now have a user. So I just ran, I just pressed this. Um, so this person is now my user. Um, so you can see user is this person. Um, and then you can run, so run press next. You can step into this function um, and then see, okay, so we've got a data frame called SFB picks. That's this argument here. It's not been evaluated yet. Um, so we press next. Uh, you run this function, so press next again. And now you've got an SFB picks data frame and the user picks data frame. So this is the, this particular user's picks. Um, and you can like view this data frame, you know, like if there's something wrong with it or whatever, you can look at these things, um, et cetera, you just browse inside of the browser function in the app while the app is still running. So you can press continue. Um, and then this will generate the player sims thing and it'll exit. And so this is actually just the state that where the app is like alive and running. So, you know, if you were to change it, it will take you back into that browser window environment. And this is kind of how I actually debug shiny apps now. I'll say another, another issue I have that I don't know of a good way to deal with it, but like, let's say on your, when you got to the, any one of those pipeline statements, 
right? Yeah. Like yeah. you just did next over. There's no easy way to say, I want to step into the semi join versus I want to step into the arranged yeah. statement. Yeah. It, you just, you just have to kind of like step through the pipe function itself and then it gets really messy. Um, yes and no. So we can load can, another yeah. user. Um, so we're in this browser function now. So we're going to press next and then we're going to step into this one. Yep. So you can actually just run this code from here. So like you can run code in this environment yourself. Well, yeah, but let's, let's say you didn't want to run it. Let's say that if running it would cause some kind of side effect that you don't necessarily want to do twice. But like if you wanted to say, this will just be like, let's say I want to, I want to get into the semi join. Uh, you know, I want to step inside of the semi join. You can't. Um, you're not, you're not, can't in from here, yeah, for sure. Right now, so what I would say, if you did want to do that, at this point, what I would do is do just a debug once semi join. Right, you could debug once semi join from inside here. I should probably undo these changes. And um, and then and then you could run the pipeline, and it'll stop the pipeline in that semi join statement. Yeah, it should. So from here, do the next, step into this, debug once, semi join. Oh. And it went ahead and did that. No, I think it's like debugging user. <laughs> Why are you yeah. debugging? Some sometimes in RC things just get debugged. Thank you. So that's actually the, that's actually the internal code for semi join. Is that how it is coded? Or like a reactive, I think. That was a reactive, yeah. Debug once semi join. Okay, so we're setting that, and then we're going to press next, and then hopefully with that debug once, it'll stop at semi join and go into semi join, right? So then use method semi-join. I mean, it's it's a useless function to look at because it doesn't see, does it take you through the methods? You have to step, would you step into this? You have to yeah. step in, yeah. Dark magic, inbound. <laughs> but I, I just take that as a, as a, for me as a debugging pattern, this kind of idea of, all right, I'm gonna do a browser or something to get me close to where I wanna be and then and then debug the from function inside the, the from inside the browser to continue to like get me the rest of the way because you know it very well could have happened that before this there were 10 other times semi join got called and you didn't want to step in any of those so you you, you know you, you can't prematurely debug semi join right and then from in here you could look at the things that are getting passed in so by player identity by player id don't copy NA matches, NA or never, um, user picks, blah, blah, blah. So from in here, you could run the next, you know, run this auto copy Y, and then the join filter um, function, which you could again step into, probably won't for the sake of this, but, you know, run this, exit out of that, and then continue onward. And then there wasn't another browser or anything, so it like stopped. But yeah, browser, Shiny. And this is something like Hadley uses a lot when he's debugging Shiny. Um, I've seen a couple videos now where he's doing it, but that first one was the one that kind of like blew my mind as to how he was using it. So he was like in this browser thing, changing the code, and then just going on from there. Like he's just like changing the app code itself and then rerunning it inside this interactive environment. And then eventually he'd stop the app, stop the debug, and then stop the app, and then rerun the app with that new code. So it was cool. Yeah, there's different strategies that work at different times and depending on the context, yeah, like sourcing a, or modifying the function and then like, you know, sort resourcing it before going back to the global session that, you know, that, that might work or that might be exactly what you would need in that scenario. 
Uh, but like, I don't know, sometimes you just need a simple browser and that'll do the job. So I think knowing all the tools is good. And it's just like, gonna depend on the context what you're gonna use. It is an art, not a science. <laughs> yeah. You can describe it. Um, but yeah. Cool. So what's your favorite? Is it browser? I think I just use browser a lot now. Um, it's kind of replaced print for me because it puts me into that environment as well. So it's not just print the thing I think is broken, but also like look at the other things and see like, is it this thing or is it, is it like, is it SFB picks user or comparison in the get team process function? I don't know, but if I put myself in there and I can look at it and go, okay, so I can not just like print like, what do you do with a data frame? You can't print a data frame. So previously, I was like super assigning it into the global environment from the um, from the like app, and then like inspecting it in the global environment. But when you put a browser window in it, you can just look at that data frame and like go over any problems in that, like whether it's a string or a data frame or you know, a list or whatever. It's a lot easier to use our studio's interactive stuff. Um, in a browser than it is to look at like it printing into your console. Like your console is kind of tricky because um, it only prints like a relatively small amount of text before it gets unintelligible. So, you know, you, you've all done it where you print like a massive list and it like takes over your console like window. Um, whereas if you put your browser in it, you can go, okay, so click on it. It opens in that like interactive viewer thing. And then you can like actually like scroll and filter and you know, whatever you need to do in there. Yeah, I think browser is my favorite too, but I'll use debug once as well a lot. Here's a fun caveat. I don't think, I, I think I looked it up once, but there's really no way to know what functions are debugged. So like if you debug a bunch of stuff and then forget to undebug them, it can get very annoying when like two hours later you call that function again and it yeah, jumps back. Yeah, I think I've run into that and was like, you know what, I'm just always going to use debug once now because then I don't have to remember. Control shift F10, favorite thing. Oh yeah, restart the restart it. Yeah. Just restart R. When in doubt, if it's doing the thing weirdly, if you set a weird option, just restart R, it's fine. Cool. So that's the end of that talk. Um, this has been like power cords broken or something. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'll answer any other questions, but debugging is kind of like just, you just got to do it. And, like, you know, have an idea of what you're looking at and Google. He did say Google as his very first step. So, you know, there are packages to auto Google, um, but just understanding what you're looking at. And that's advanced R has helped me a lot with that. Like, you're in this environment and it can't find this. Um, or, you know, this is quoted, but it should be quoted or whatever. Those are all things you kind of just pick up by like working with stuff. So it's less of a theory thing and more just an application thing to me. He also says that you can ask people and I want to submit a PR that you should just ask the R4DS Slack cough Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> Or, you know what, just never have bugs. Uh, what was it, like uh, John Murdoch or from Financial Times, the guy who was doing all the COVID charts, he said uh, every time he had a bug or like a, yeah, his code aired out, his RStudio session crashed. So he just stopped having bugs. So you just had to write perfect code all the time. Then yeah. Oh, God. Months later, he finally figured it out. But you just don't write code with bugs and you don't have to debug. <laughs> 